Welcome back to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. So I have been trying to get this woman on for a long time and finally was able to. It was such an honor. But you guys, this is like such an embarrassment because when I was almost done with the interview, I mean, listen, we've gotten an you know, almost an hour into the interview. I was doing it alone in my house. I had my producer and my editors in the living room holding my dogs because they kept barking and making noises. So it was a one time I've done an interview all alone in my room. I had done three that day and you're not gonna believe it, but my computer died while I was in the middle of talking to her. So I'm just warning you, you're going to hear a little abrupt ending at the end, but we are basically done with our interview. I could have asked a couple more questions. I could have kept talking, but I do know that her phone was blowing up as was mine and it was fine to end it there because we got such a good conversation out of her. But um, obviously, as you all know, Melissa Rivers is a very interesting woman. She's a businesswoman, a single mother, and the daughter of the iconic Joan Rivers. Melissa opens up about standing out on her own, her family, dealing with grief in the public eye. She also gives a glimpse into her time on Celebrity Apprentice, which she did with her mother, and what it was like to interact and be friends with Donald Trump. She also talks about classic fashion police days with her mom when Joan held nothing back. She also gets into what her mother would have thought about life as we know it now, things like COVID and Donald Trump becoming president. So I think you guys will be very happy with this episode. Please let me know what your thoughts are. Subscribe if you have not. Um, Leave a comment if you're watching on YouTube down below. Um, Leave five stars. I really appreciate it. And it's a way that we rank our podcasts. And um, it would be really helpful to me to get some feedback if you love these episodes. So guys, get ready for Melissa Rivers. Um, I, Melissa, I just interviewed, um, Mariah Harmony, uh, Taurus, you know what I mean? From Pitbulls and Paroli. She did an interview with you. Yeah. My, daughter, my owner's a celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever watch that show? I watch very strange things. Oh, what do you watch? Um, I am a big true crime person, which isn't so strange anymore. Yeah. Um, a lot of documentaries and I am addicted to below deck really all of them why that's so interesting have you do you, so good have you I done the show House, i don't watch housewives okay i don't watch vanderpump i don't watch any of the other ones but below deck you're into beyond that's beyond yeah um, and i've gotten my boyfriend who is a litigator so into it it's so yeah. funny he's like what is this and now he's like is it on yeah. like he's gone back and watched all the seasons so it's funny um w- regarding true crime i watched the id network religiously for years i was obsessed i mean i would sometimes not go on a date because like my favorite show was on or something i understand i by the way yeah. i understand that completely yeah and even now i think to myself oh, it's Friday or Saturday, like date night, date line is on or whatever. And it's one I really want to see um, or whatever. It, I have to really, I'm not dating anyone right now. So it, it's funny. It's like, I have to decide if I want to go on a date or if I'd rather watch the true crime thing that's on that night. Usually because, the true crime. Yeah, because it becomes a complete waste of my life. I wait, I just, wait, I just sent my boyfriend something really funny this morning. I just have to look it up really fast. Oh, I sent him a thing that said, Keep and keep your marriage fresh by writing each other love notes. Like I considered smothering you with a pillow last night, but I didn't. <laughs> right. I considered putting antifreeze in your coffee, coffee. but I didn't. Yeah. And he wrote back, love you too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, all right. So we're But that's one of the things we bonded over was our love of true crime. Oh, that's amazing. How'd you guys meet? Uh at an event. Oh, nice. Okay. But not at any crime scene or anything. (laughs) No, but I would have really like, that would have been a super cool story. 
Right. <laughs> That's funny. So we have a mutual friend, David Yontef. Yes, who, we do. Who, by the way, when I first did his show, the first thing he said to me when we started the interview is, you know, you look exactly like Melissa Rivers. Oh my and God. I'm so sorry. He said that you are so much prettier. Stop it. No, but you I, are. You oh, are. That's I am very not. Sweet. I am exactly. not delusional. So I apologize. Oh, cut it out. No, it was such an honor to be in the same sentence as you. So I thought that was very funny. And thank you. I so don't see myself that way. So, <laughs> well, you are very beautiful. So it's, yeah. a, it's a compliment to me. Thank um, you. But uh, it's interesting because I know you have a monthly podcast episode or, you know, whatever with him on reality TV. Yes, and- our reality roundup where he yes. brings me up to speed on a lot of things and we have lots of discussion yeah. and he's like the housewives and Vanderpump expert and I'm like the below deck expert. Right. Got it. So we've started to do that. Not, not as often. I mean, my podcast hasn't been around as long, so we've only done it twice. Um, but I was curious because whenever I talk to him about reality TV or recently, I just had on, um, Vanessa Riser, who's the ex fiance of Louis Rulas, whatever his name is from, uh, housewives of New Jersey. And by the way, I don't really watch these shows, so it's not, I, I don't have these conversations or put people on my show because I want to talk about reality TV. Really. I want to hear their story. Um, the, the backlash and bullying and anger that has come out about certain people, just having someone on my show offended so many other people who are, you know, in favor, who are big fans of Teresa, right? Or, you know, if David and I talk about a certain topic and they, you know, are on the other side of what we're saying, they, mm-hmm. I've never seen such bullying. And, you know, I started to notice with reality TV and Bravo kind of, you know, with this whole Vanderpump thing, how much the cyber bullying that goes on and bullying within, um, you know, the fans. And I, and I think it's kind of incredible. Have you noticed that at all? Or do you see that? I haven't seen that, but I do know it's a very interesting phenomenon. And I think back to what used to happen to soap stars Hmm. where people were so invested in the stories that the line became very blurred for people on the character versus the person and used to hear stories. I remember as a little girl hearing about soap stars getting people coming up and like screaming at them in public. And I think it's a lot of, it's sort of the next generation of that Mm -hmm. because people are so invested in the stories and these lives Yeah, that, you know, people just, they have to hear, they've got to get their opinion out. And it's, you know, it's, it's a little scary. Mm. I'm not in favor of bullying, um, which is a whole other topic, especially cyber bullying. Yeah. But it is incredible how much it's become part of the, the, the cultural zygeist, zygeist. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in, in, in that people have so much emotion invested in these. Right. And it's, it's interesting to me because you watch these people who get so offended. And in my opinion, it's that they're triggered about something in their own life that's happened on screen as well. You know, for example, with this Vanderpump thing, so many people took a side, right? Of course they didn't like Raquel or whatever her name is and Tom, and they all were pro the other girl. And I just felt like it was very interesting. It's one thing to be invested in take sides or whatever, because you, you don't believe in cheating, which is of course fine. But, um, it's another thing to, you know, call the girl, the names that they were calling her. And even on the reunion, I thought it became really gross, um, how they treated the both of them and almost how the adults in the room let that happen. Because I have an 11 year old daughter and I don't like bullying. I mean, I've seen bullying happen in her school. I grew up in Manhattan. I went to an all girls private school our generation knows what bullying is. I mean, that's, it's a different level. And that's one of the first times I've really seen that uh, like live on TV like that and been like, wow, no one's protecting these people because I've been through a lot in my life. You definitely have to. (laughs) 
And, you know, I've definitely gotten a lot of cyberbullying myself and I've been able to get through it, um, but it affects your mental health. You're the only person that goes to sleep at night in the darkness. You put your head on the pillow and you hear those things repeat in your head, even though people want to act like it doesn't really mean something to them. And reading those comments or hearing people say things to you like all these things, I don't even want to repeat them, but it takes a toll and it, and it is scary to me as a mother of an 11 year old. And I know you have a son. I mean, how do you deal with cyberbullying as, as a parent? Um, you know, my son's 22. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this sort of wave of this was happening as he was growing up. It is not at this level that it is now, but you know, one of the things we always talked about is never put anything up that you wouldn't want your grandmother to see. Mm. Yeah. And that goes for comments too. Yeah. And I'm not talking about between you and your friends. I think the toll it takes on teenagers and preteens mental health is abhorrent mm. when you start hearing, oh, you should go kill yourself. Like you don't say that. Yeah. But in particular with the reality shows in, in, in drilling down and actually to what we're talking about, people see what reflections of their life. So it's like, they've always wanted to tell the woman that she, that their boyfriend cheated on them with exactly how they felt. And these are also people holding themselves out and either their good behavior or their bad behavior for public consumption. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit with that in particular, you know, one of the down, one of the downfalls. Yeah. I've seen, I get so much positive and I get so much negative and the negative shit I get is unbelievable. Yeah. But the positive outweighs it. But when you're doing something on a reality show and you have screwed up like that, mm -hmm. because you're on the reality show, you've got to remember the whole world is involved in your relationship, not just your circle. That's right. I'm not saying that the cyber bullying is okay. And I'm not saying that it, it, it doesn't take a toll, but you gotta, you know, the chickens came home to roost mm -hmm. and it wasn't a private situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, very yeah. often I look at shows when people have, when stuff like that happens, like, did, have you not watched the show before you went on it? Do you not know what you're signing up for? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and in, and in, you know, situations like yours, you didn't sign up for that. I did not sign up for that. But I got involved with somebody who was uh, one of the fam most famous men in the world. So, um, you know, but you I also thought your private life was going to stay private. Correct. Correct. And I had no. We're not you were, were not as well versed and as educated in the pitfalls of it then as we are now. No, of course not. And it was, you know, I, you know, when you're younger um, and a lot of your self-worth comes from who you're with, I guess, is how I would put it. You know, that's how I felt at that time, you know. Oh, 100%. And that's still a trap for women. I'm watching one friend of mine, actually, who's in the middle of a divorce, who is just realizing now that her entire sense of self was because of who she was married to. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a hard thing. And you learn it later from lessons that you go through. But I mean, I went through that for quite a while. I had a, you know, difficult upbringing, a difficult relationship with men in general. My father died of a cocaine overdose when he was 44. I was 15. I was sent oh, to- Oh, good a, times. Yeah, horrible. And I was sent to a therapeutic boarding school, the same one that Paris went to, but the, I was there, I graduated from there. So I was there for three years, went through the whole program and never lived at home since I was 12. And my relationship with men was always just, you know, I didn't grow up knowing what unconditional love was. I didn't know what a family was. I was aching for love. I found it in the wrong places. And, you know, I can't say that I didn't know any better, better. Cause as you go through life, you do know better, but I, I made mistakes based on where I was in my life. I would never do that again, but I'm also okay with the fact that like, you have to learn from your mistakes. And it's, it's been hard for me on that topic, just because so many people like to pigeonhole me in that. And, and they stigmatize the woman in that. And I have had a very hard time moving forward. I mean, that situation happened 14 years ago, but it's like, people talk about it like it was yesterday and still shame me for it. Like it was yesterday. Okay, but that's what really you hard. just said is so, in my opinion, honest and compelling 
and a lesson that you can teach other women, starting with don't value, don't don't get your self-worth from who you are with. And that is something that, you know, when my father committed suicide, it was obviously tragic and horrible and all these things. And, but I now am the co-chair of the board of a major mental health and suicide prevention national organization. So I always say I took something horrible and made it something so incredibly positive. Yeah. And you have that opportunity Mm -hmm. to do that. And I think, you know, and again, I don't know. I think that's a real lane for you. Yeah. And a real value that you can bring to other people. Like, look, I fucked up. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, but I can tell you from where I'm standing now, this is what I learned. A hundred percent. And here's, and there's a really positive message in it. Yeah. And And I think it's important. I agree. And, and so many people want to, especially with social media now, which we didn't have back then, but it was like, people want to promote their life as the best of whatever you're looking at, the filtered pictures, the happy, you know, faces and everything that's going on, but everyone is dealing with something. And I think it is okay to fail. I think it's okay to make mistakes as long as you learn from them. And I believe that life is like a pendulum. I happen to have a tattoo down my back that says with it, without pain, happiness has no meaning. And I do believe, I mean, I've been through a lot and so many people have, and I think it's okay to marinate in those moments because you know that at some point, as long as you know what that dark moment is or those bad choices you've made or the grief and the sorrow, whatever it is, you can get to the other side of the pendulum, which then is happiness or making the right choices or finding that right path. And sometimes you have to take a wrong term to make a right turn. So I've definitely- one of the, As I say, one of the best examples of that is- my- Monica Lewinsky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and who honestly, I was like, oh my God, I was 20. Mm-hmm. You know, and now I see it, and this has become an incredible public speaker and author and very respected, uh, you know, person in her. She's a brilliant writer. Yeah. And people now see her as, such a positive. Yeah. I and that was, you know, we've all made bad choices, but wow, that was a really bad choice. Yeah. yeah. But also a, a, a lesson in how, you know, people get enamored by powerful men and powerful mm-hmm. men can say things to make you think it's okay, no matter what your age, sort of, you know, um, I'm watching a friend fall, go through it now. Yeah. And people fall into that trap and um, no one is better than, you know, anyone else in making these decisions, you know? So uh, I think it's uh, an interesting topic. And, uh, and honestly, from the time that Monica was in it and I was in it, um, you know, cheating has become sort of a very normal thing these days. Like you see it in either reality shows, but you also see it in that everyday life. I see it all the time with someone's cheated on someone. And then, you know, it's like, they almost get praised for it. It's like not that big of a deal anymore, you know, and people are getting back together with them and it's like the norm. So at the time I was shamed for it. She was shamed for it. And, um, you know, it's interesting how it's. Well, now I think with cheating, especially, you know, with actors and actresses and athletes and these tech billionaires, I even find myself falling into the trap saying, well, what did they think was going to happen? Right. Yeah. And that's not okay either. No. no. What did they expect? Well, they expected someone not to be an asshole. Yeah. But boy, oh boy, you know, but, and and that's, I think a bad thing too, to be like, well, what did they expect? What they think was going to happen? Well, they thought they didn't think that was going to happen. That's right. And I think that's, that's, that's a trap also that I know I've fallen into discussing people with my friends. Well, what did they think was going to happen? Mm, yeah. Yeah. And nobody goes into something thinking that's what's going to happen. No, of course not. Of course not. Step into a world of nonstop action on DraftKings Casino. Play the classics like blackjack, roulette, and slots. Plus, enjoy exclusive games you can't find anywhere else. Right now, new customers can get a deposit match up to $100 in casino credits when you deposit just $5 or more. All you have to do is sign up, select the offer, make your deposit, and start playing from a full suite of games. 
Your way is the only way to play on DraftKings Casino. Play online, on your time, in your space, and within your means. It's safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you're ready. Download the DraftKings Casino app now, sign up with promo code UNDERSTOOD, and new customers get a deposit match up to $100 in casino credits when you deposit $5 or more. Only on DraftKings Casino with promo code UNDERSTOOD. So once again, download the app, sign up with promo code UNDERSTOOD. DraftKings Casino. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Please play responsibly in partnership with Hollywood Casino at Charlestown Races in West Virginia. All games regulated by the West Virginia Lottery. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. 21 plus. Physically present in Connecticut, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia only. Void in Ontario. One per opt-in new customer. Minimum $5 deposit. Max match $100 in casino credits, which require one times playthrough within seven days. See terms at casino.draftkings.com slash players choice. Restrictions apply. So you have a podcast, Melissa Rivers Group Text that we see behind you. How did you come up with that name, by the way? I have a very um, diverse group of friends and, you know, everyone has their own separate group texts on my phone. And I found it fascinating that we all talk about different things. And I thought if I'm doing that, everyone else is doing that. And is that the kind of guest that you have on your show? You're just talking about different things with different people? But it's very much talking about these things with celebrities. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we're talking about things in the news, but we're, I, try and always make sure it's a conversation. And I do dig really deep in the research and sometimes, you know, try and come up with something that, you know, I've been interviewed so many times Mm -hmm. that I know what a bad interview is. Mm -hmm. And when people clearly haven't done their research or when they're just boring and reading off a piece of paper and I make it my point not to do that, Yeah. And, you know, very often the conversations will go all different directions. And very often at the beginning, I'll say, okay, let's just talk about the project you're promoting first, because I've also been on the side where you're like, are you ever going to ask me about why I'm here? Or I'll say, don't worry, we're going to get to it. Yeah. So, you know, and I think it's because I've been so many times on both sides that I always be like, we're going to get, let's get the business out of the way. Mm Mm-hmm. So you obviously, as you said, have been interviewed so many times. You have this podcast. What would you say makes a great interview guest? Like, how would you pick someone that you think is fantastic? Come to play. That's a Come guy. to play. And what about a good topic? What makes a good topic? Yeah. Um, anything that you have in common ground with someone. Okay. Like you because already that- talked about, but like you brought up, we're both moms. Yeah. We can end up talking about kids and the pitfalls of society or stupid things they've done. Or I can talk about that. I'm no longer have a teenager and oh boy, I know what you're in in for. for. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a universal thing. And if you can connect with somebody, yeah, then it all just flows. Yeah. I think that that is so important to have chemistry with the person you're talking to, because there are so many times that I've been interviewed a ton as well. And I've interviewed people as well. And it's, you know, when you don't have chemistry with someone and it makes it almost hard and uncomfortable. Um, And then there are topics, you know, my show is mostly about people or things that are misunderstood or people that are just so interesting that you want to understand more about them. And Mm -hmm. for me, I have to prepare to know who the person is, obviously that I'm talking, but I go into it thinking, well, I'm just going to ask the questions that I'm interested in knowing. Because right. for the most part, the ever, the average person has all those questions as well. And I'm sure, you know, obviously people have interviewed you and asked you so many questions about your mother, but there's so much interesting about you as well that so many people don't know, you know, like whatever your favorite drink is or your favorite show that you talked about at the beginning that you're watching. I mean, I, I find that kind of thing fascinating. And for me having a podcast, I mean, I'm interviewing a certain person. I'm interviewing the type of person that, um, usually is on a mission to change their narrative or that has something that everyone wants to hear. You know, um, on Friday, I'm, I'm interviewing a a CEO of a company that is, is doing ketamine induced therapy for mental health. I find that fascinating. I don't know anything about it. A couple of weeks ago, I interviewed, um, the first, um, LGBTQ athlete that went to Harvard. He was, um, recruited to go to Harvard as a woman on the swimming team as a woman, and then started his year swimming on the men's team because he transitioned in that year. And I, those are all 
things that I know nothing about. I'm almost scared to get into those conversations because you never know like what might be offensive or how to ask the right question. But it's things that I think a lot of people might be interested in or don't ask questions because they're in fear of the answers. Do you know? Well, you can also start by saying, look, I am fascinated, but I am walking on eggshells because I don't even know I might fall into a trap. So I'm going to let you guide me. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so if people are going on your podcast, is there one in particular that you think was outstanding or a guest you really loved? <laughs> I always love the comedians. Oh, I always love the comedians because right. there's, I can relate. Mm-hmm. I can relate to that, relate to them on actually what it's like to be one. Mm as I was raised by one. Right. So I have a complete, I have an insight that is not necessarily peer to peer, but a step outside. So I can ask questions like, okay, you know, you know, and say you, I'll always start with, you guys know that you're not like normal, mentally healthy human beings. And I can see that. Is that true though? That must Wait, I've heard that though, that most comedians have some sort of thing that they're running from, which was is what makes them so funny. Is that absolutely true? absolutely? So I come from that point of view where I can legitimately ask, you know, you all are really fucked up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like you own that, right? Okay. What right. was your childhood like? Right, right. And you know, you, and and I would say after all these years, I kind of know how to set them up to be funny. Right. Well, I was going to say in doing interviews, do you find that sometimes they're not funny? And when they're on stage and have that platform, they're great. But like in one on one, do they change their personality? Oh, lots of them do. Yeah, lots of them do. And and you know, you know how to pivot during those interviews. Yeah. And again, I bring it back to myself in the sense of I can say. You know, my mother had an incredibly complicated relationship with her parents mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and, and be able to cite things like that. And that I think puts other people at ease right? to say, where I can say, were you the funny one? And very often they'll say, no one else thought I was, they just right. thought I was the weirdo, you know? So always when you can put a part of yourself that's honest into it Mm -hmm. it can change the 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 dynamic of a relationship i I have an interview i just was interviewing evan handler who is Mm. so smart and so lovely and so funny but i had actually read his first book when it came out probably almost 20 years ago and he was like, you did? I'm like, yeah. And I had to buy it retail. <laughs> and he starts off, but that also changed the dynamic of, and it was already a good interview, mm-hmm. but it took it to another level. Yeah. yeah. Because he was like, you're not just interested in me from for this interview. I'm like, no, I think it's really interesting. And I got him to talk about stuff that he normally, I don't think talks about. Yeah, right. So you've met almost everybody, I assume, at this point in your life. A lot there, of people. Is there anyone that's on your bucket list to interview on your show? Mm, there are. There are for different reasons. Brad Pitt, because he's funny. Is he funny? Very. George Clooney, because he's funny. Okay. I would love to interview Harrison Ford. Again, very dry humor. In non, I love talking to athletes and I don't get a lot of them on the show, Mm -hmm. Um, especially because I'm a sports junkie. You are. Um, Oh my God. And people don't know that. And there's- What are your favorite teams? I'm a diehard Eagles fan. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And I won my fantasy league this year. Okay. That props to me. Um. And I, I, I would love to, I love talking to people who have witnessed history. Yeah, that's true. I was so, a history major in college. So that is, you know, fascinating to me. I would have loved to have interviewed a Madeline Albright. Right. 
I also am a news junkie like that. Like I, I find those kind of people fascinating. Um, so you've interviewed or sorry, you have met so many people, some of the people, you know, I've looked back on, or I remember you spending time with are people that maybe now have fallen into some scandal or a little bit of, um, you know, their names are in the, in the paper a lot. Like, for example, you were on Celebrity Apprentice with Donald Trump and your mother. Um, but I want to ask you about your relationship with Donald Trump. There isn't one. Well, what was it like being on a show? Well, again, this was someone that I knew socially mm-hmm. beforehand. And my mother knew socially when my mother's best friend is his ex-sister-in-law. Oh. who was married to his brother, Robert. So like when Robert died, I did send a condolence note. Um, What was it like? It was, it's the hardest show I've ever done. And I've done some really hard shows. How much of it was reality and how much of it was staged? You work your fucking ass off. You do. You ask anyone. It's six days a week from, you. women were usually getting into hair and makeup probably around 6 a.m., and the day ended when the day ended. Right. And then you were usually doing work after. What was the charity one. you were doing it for? Uh, I, for a children's charity. Okay. Um, but it, you know, we always used to laugh that we were so jealous of the men because they at least got one day off a week. You know, the women had to, like, you had one day you could do your hair color, your nails, your this, that. Um, so you know, all of our basic maintenance all had to be jammed into one day, but you worked your ass off. And, you know, again, you knew who he was going in. Mm -hmm. It wasn't some, there was no great revelation to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And love him or hate him, he is a brilliant salesman. He really is. And that show was brilliant. The show was brilliant. He's a brilliant marketer. How many weeks was production? I don't even remember. I think it was about a month. Wow. Okay. So and you, you were really an episode, there. You shot an episode every two days. Okay. So you, it was a grind. And it how long, how long a, did you make it? Uh, I made it pretty far. I made it to the one, two, three, four. I think I was the last one to go before the final four Mm. or five one of the two okay so after my whole um incident in 2000 shall we call it the let's make it fancy the scandal yes the scandal in um 2009 um I actually became a, a little bit of a recluse because it was really, I mean, I was just a normal person before this. So it was hard for me to all of a sudden be catapulted to like the number one name that everyone's talking about. But I got a call um, from Donald Trump one morning and he said, I want you to be on the next Celebrity Apprentice. Um, and he said, it's favored nations. I have no idea what any of this meant, you know? And he's like, what charity would you use? And I thought of the only charity that had ever affected me, which was the Red Cross when I lost my fiance in September 11th, they completely changed my life. I mean, I was a kid. I was, I mean, I was 26, but I really, I leaned on my fiance. His name was Andy. He was older than me. He was 32 at the time, but I idolized him and, you know, I did everything to impress him. You know, I felt like a kid at the time. So, um, I, the Red Cross helped me. I had to move out of my apartment. I couldn't afford it anymore. We lived together. He was paying the rent. Um, and the Red Cross gave me a hundred thousand dollars to get a new place to live and really got me off my feet. So I came from a place of being really genuine. I'm like, this, you know, charity means a lot to me. He's like, I love it. For some reason that Red Cross had never been used as a charity. And, um, I was really excited to be asked to do that because everyone in the news, hated me. My family, my friends had all deserted me. They thought I was a bad look or whatever. And for me, I was like, listen, if people don't like me after I show who I am, that's fair game, but it's not okay to not like me based on what the media reports and the, the public's consumption for that kind of gossip, because that, that was what was so debilitating to me. So I really wanted to do that show, but I was also nervous because I thought, well, he could dislike me because I knew he was friends with Tiger. And I thought this could also go badly, but I had lunch with 
uh, Michael Cohen. He told me everything would be fine. And, you know, it, it was my, the, my, the rogues gallery. Yes. Right. So it was a very interesting, um, dynamic that went down and then something happened. It veered off. And I ended up meeting with Dr. Drew, who, do you know, you know, Dr. I know Drew, Drew very right? well. And he is, tell me if you have this experience with him when you are in the room with him and there's a hundred other people, you, and you're having a conversation, you were the most important person to him. Um, and I just love that about him. And I was really in an awful place. And he sat down with me. They were begging me to do celebrity rehab. I said, I don't have an addiction. I didn't have an addiction. Um, they wanted me on the show for their reasons. But for me, I chose to do that show instead of um, Celebrity Apprentice because of Drew. And he's like, you need help right now. You've become a recluse. You are struggling. And I really was struggling. And I just knew this guy got me and I needed a friend. And that's why I chose to do the show. Um, so that's what happened. And then of course, Donald Trump, I saw on TMZ a week or so later, like, oh, I don't even know who that woman is. Why would I offer her a, a, a spot on my show? And I was just like, I made the right decision because I picked the the one guy who I thought really was going to help me. And to this day, we're very close. And, you know, I was glad that I that I didn't do that. But I always wondered how I would do on the show because I thought it was such a fascinating show. You know, it's about being smart. Yeah. It's about not letting your guard down. Mm -hmm. It's about just it's about hard work. It's about, unfortunately, you learn not to trust anybody. Yeah. You know, and what was it like? Really a game is a game of survivor. Yeah. Right. And what was it like doing it with your mom? You know, my mom and I worked together. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was a very easy transition. Mm -hmm. You know, do we drive each other crazy? Yes. We always drive each other crazy. You know, <laughs> that wasn't anything new. So, you know, it was very nice in the beginning to at least have someone that I had had my back and she knew I had hers. You had an ally built in. And we it. knew what the show wanted to see. And we actively worked against us, against that. They wanted to see us fighting and against each other and blow ups. And that's not who we were. And we didn't allow ourselves to be portrayed that way. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think that was, you know, I think somewhere deep inside, they wanted the finale to be between the two of us. Mm. But it's just, that was not our nature. That is not who we were. And we weren't going to be, you know, pushed into that situation. Right. Did we talk about that? It would be a great PR thing. Yeah. You got two old war horses from the business, two old hands at it going, what would be the best way to play this? But then we we're like, it's just, let's just be who we are. Right. And I'm curious about your childhood. What was that like growing up with two parents like you had? And when did you first realize that you came from a family different than others? You know, it's not one of those things that like one moment a light bulb goes off because that's your normal. Yeah. You know, would you go to other people's houses and you start to understand that, you know, your family was not like the others and what your parents did for a living was not like the others. But my parents very actively created a very normal and traditional home life. Mm -hmm. the, easiest you way to, the easiest way to explain it is, I, and I always share this with people, to the day my mom died, the phone at her home was answered Rosenberg residence. And to wow. the day she died, my friends called her Mrs. R or Mrs. Rosenberg. Wow. And that tells you about the level of traditional values that were part of our lives. And I think that is one of the reasons I've stayed so grounded. And it's one of the, one of the things I've done with my son. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he'll say, when did you realize? It's like, it was just kind of a slow roll and knowing that we were different, but as different as my parents were in our, their professional lives, there wasn't some jarring difference when I went to my friend's houses. Yeah. So I have but that was it by the way, but that was an active decision yeah. by my parents. Okay. So what I was going to say is I have a daughter who's 11 and relationships between mothers and daughters. Complicated. And I was raised by a single mother who, you know, I did not grow up being very close with. And thank God she has a really nice relationship with my daughter because I wouldn't have a relationship with her at this point. I'm curious because you seem like you were best friends with your mom. What was your childhood relationship? like with her? 
again, and people don't want to hear this, very normal. Hmm. You know, when you're a teenager, you hate your parents. And having been a parent of a teenager, there are days that you really don't like them. Yeah. And my parents used to say to me, and I do that, I did that with, I do it still with Cooper. I will always love you. This is my piece of parenting advice for you. I will always love you, but I do not like you right now. It's a good, good line. <laughs> and that's a, that's a really solid way to communicate with your teen. Mm. I'm not taking away love. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, I would not be your friend in this moment. Yeah. I do not like you right now. <laughs> So it's like, everyone's like, oh, you guys are better. We had such a normal mother-daughter relationship in all that that means. And that's why people related to us so much on TV. Mm -hmm. People still come up to me and be like, oh my God, we, I was you, your mom. Like people related to the fact that just because we were super close didn't mean we didn't fight. Yeah, right, of course. You know, the great story I always tell about my mom is, we had had a knockdown, drag out fight. I mean, knockdown, drag out over the phone. And it was right before she was flying to LA and she stayed, she was always, she always stayed with me. And um, at one point I did say to her, you know, you know, you do not respect or even care about my boundaries. If you treated your friends the way you treat me, you would have no friends, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So she comes in and the next morning she's standing in my kitchen, eating out of the refrigerator. And she looked at me and she said, you know what? I've been thinking. And I'm like, did I actually get through to her? And she goes, I acknowledge that you have boundaries. I just choose not to respect them. (laughs) I mean, what do you do with that? (laughs) Okay. You know, but that was such a mom answer. Totally. I acknowledge them. I don't respect them, but I acknowledge them. Right. So obviously a lot of people know you as as almost being a partner with your mom on a lot of different things. But before sure. that, I know you've had some jobs that were unrelated to entertainment. What was like your first real normal thing that you did? Oh, well, I had all sorts of internships and I worked a summer, you know, in a store and I worked at our beach club. And I mean, I had all the normal jobs, but I was definitely on my own trajectory before E came around. Mm-hmm. I had been at, uh, at MTV. I was on air at MTV. I was on air at CBS news. I had, was one of the final three standing for what eventually became the Ricky Lake show. I had shot a pilot for my own talk show at that point. And then, you know, I had done tons of stuff and then E came around. And my mother did one red carpet for them. And then they came to her and said, do you think, or I was already my own person. Melissa would be interested in doing this with you. And we must've been arguing because she said, I have no idea. idea. You'll have to ask her yourselves because if I ask her, not the answer will automatically be no. (laughs) (laughs) Said like a true mother about their What were you doing at the time, incidentally? I had just finished uh, my own pilot for a TV show. I just found out it hadn't gotten picked up. Um, I was starting to develop, I'm trying to remember another show. I had a couple other offers for what were the beginning of panel shows that Mm -hmm. were still in development. And it was kind of one of those moments where I wasn't quite sure Mm -hmm. what was going to be next. And, you know, we all have those moments in our careers and I'm thought, well, I'll try it. So how was that? Like what, what went on? How was the beginning of filming, getting the show off the ground? What was that like for you guys? It was so exciting. Was it? it was, we were doing something that no one else had done. Mm-hmm. And that's always exciting and fun and terrifying. And you feel like such a part of the team. Mm-hmm with everybody who's creating this new genre and believing that it could happen and not giving up and then watching it grow. It was right. so exciting and were there, terrifying. Were there certain episodes that stand out to you or things that you would do that stood out to you of things that came in after that? Well, you know, with the red carpet, you never, part of it was being live. Yeah. 
and never knowing what was going to happen. And you have to like enjoy flying without a net. Right. And, you know, there were definitely some moments where you're like, oops, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but you learn as you go. And it always is those oops moments that sort of end up being your favorite. Right. Exactly. Um, What do you think about um, the difference between then and how you could talk about people and what they looked like, I guess, and ask them certain questions and be outspoken about things and how things are now. I mean, obviously with cancel culture and all this stuff, but what do you think, you know, what, what do you think about that? I think we're finally just starting to get back to being allowed to have fun again. Mm. And I always say, you know, every the red carpet turned into this thing and making statements and serious. And there were certain times, like I thought the Golden Globes where all the women wore black was one of the best fashion Golden Globes we'd ever had. It was like the ultimate project runway. Mm. Here's the assignment. Now let's see how you all deal with it. It was brilliant. And I came out and said, can we have a color for every award show? Like this was Mm -hmm. awesome because we got to see so much more personality coming through the clothing. And- designers truly working with these women Mm -hmm. to do something. It was like a a challenge. It was great. Um, Oh God, you know, let's just remember what we're congratulating ourselves for. Mm. Nobody's nobody's just won the Nobel prize in physics. That's true. (laughs) You know, let's all take a deep breath and not take ourselves so seriously. Yes. It's absolutely a platform to talk, get out things about important topics. But you're walking into a building to a party. Yeah, right. Let's not, and people want the relief. People want to see their stars be stars, want to see the fantasy. Because that's really what the red carpets are. Yeah, yeah. And don't take that entertainment away from people. Mm. I'm a sucker for beauty products. You should see what my bathroom looks like. And I'm obsessed with anything that's easy to use, has great results, and can save me money. Kitsch does all three. It's a literal game changer. Kitsch started in 2010 with just a hustle and a dream, and I know all about the hustle. The company is self-funded, female-founded, and is now carried in over 20,000 retail locations. They believe everyone deserves a little indulgence, no matter your budget, your skin type, or your hair type. You've probably seen Kitsch's satin pillowcases, caps, and eye masks, which are great for your hair and skin while you sleep. Or maybe they're heatless satin curling rollers, which totally save your hair from heat damage. The latest kitsch craze is their rice water shampoo bars. They can improve your overall hair growth and fullness. And who doesn't love that? So I have to be honest with you. I started noticing kitsch when I would go into my local CVS, let's say. And I saw it right up front and I loved the packaging. I thought it was interesting. And so finally I tried one item. It's a soap and a type of razor that you can shave your skin with. It was the best razor I've ever used. That was how I first came into contact with Kitsch. And then all of a sudden I started seeing these heat rollers and these things you could put in your hair that's heatless. And then I started seeing the satin pillowcases. And I was like, this company is amazing. I love their products. And now anytime I stop in there, I have to buy something from them because I'm always just like going to that section to see what they have. It's adorable, it's cute, and it's actually useful. So for a limited time, you can live out your Barbie dream with the Barbie by Kitsch collection featuring Kitsch's best-selling satin pillowcases and iconic Barbie pink. I got two of those for my daughter and I, and we totally love them. We bring them over to the couch, we watch our movies with them, and I sleep with them. It's fantastic, and it makes your bedding look amazing. Right now, Kitsch is offering you 30% off your entire order at mykitsch.com slash understood. That's right, 30% off anything and everything at mykitsch, K-I-T-S-C-H dot com slash understood. That's one more time, mykitsch.com slash understood for 30% off your order. Guys, go on the website, check it out. You are going to love the products. When did you find out you had such a love for fashion? Oh, I think I always, my mother always had it. It was always part of our, our lives. Okay. Did she always dress fabulous and oh, yeah. colorful and 
Um, and so did this just take, give you the ability to take it to the next level and really dive into things or you had, you, you really studied fashion before this? Um, not studied you know, in school, but I mean, right. Really no, paid attention. I always, you know, I, like I said, I was a history major. So, mm -hmm. so much of fashion and cultural history is reflected in each other mm -hmm. and there's all sorts of ties. And I just found the history of fashion so fascinating. Mm -hmm. and loving the art of it. Yeah. You know, and so that was always something I was very interested in. And then to be asked to do this as part of your job, of course you study up. Of course you take the opportunity to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, I could never explain to you how something was cut. I do not understand. I understand some of the technical but I don't understand all of the technical, but I know what I like. I see what's happening. I understand sometimes what people are trying to do. And very often I would turn on our show to like George or Brad and say, explain this to me. Really? I don't care. Please explain to me why this is fantastic because I'm not seeing it. Right. Right. You know, and fashion is fun. Yeah, it is. So like now these days, do you care so much about what you're wearing? Do you look at what other people are wearing? Like what's your relationship with fashion now? Always. I love seeing what people are wearing. I'm always like, oh God, I wish I could wear that a lot of times because I am small mm -hmm. and I can, and where my mother could wear big things on the top and own them and work them, even though she was smaller than me, mm -hmm. she had that presence. I know like for me, I can't wear anything with lots going on up here. Yeah, me either. Um, and sometimes I'm very jealous. Like I wish I could wear that, but I know that I get lost in my clothes mm -hmm. or my mother never got lost in clothes. So of course I look at stuff and go, oh God, I wish I could wear that. Or, oh my God, that's so fantastic. And oh, I wish I was still, you know, 25 and could get away with that, you right. know? But I, I definitely always feel like I, as my mother always just say, don't make anyone disappointed that they've seen you. Good point. Very good. You know, and that doesn't mean I don't go out in sweats and cutoffs and all that, because I do. My mother used to get very annoyed that I was so casual, you know, you know, she was always just like, don't let anyone be disappointed. You don't want anyone to go back to their friends and say, oh my God, she looked like shit. Right. Right. So it's a different level of awareness. Um, and much more as I get older, mm. I'm much more aware of it, but, um, you know, I, I think what's happening to me is I'm becoming much more minimalistic. Mm. I'm really paring down. And I think a lot of people are, Yeah. um, where I know what looks good on me. I know what works on me and I try and stick to that and take a risk with a color or an accessory or figure out where I am comfortable taking a risk. Right. Without you, looking stupid. What are your favorite designers or brands right now? Oh God. Um, you know, I always go back to Stella McCartney. Um, I, her suits are the best for me. Um, a lot of Stella, a lot of, um, there's a lot of Calvin Klein for a long time. Mm. A lot of Michael Kors, not so much right now. Um, I just was watching, uh, the Valentino runway. I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. Um, I tend to go with your more, um, designers that's about the cut. Yeah. Got it. And when you're I sitting love, around, I love, for example, I love Victoria Beckham. Yes. Brilliant. You know, I, I that love silhouette is so gorgeous. It's gorgeous. I always love Carolina Herrera just cause it's ex, you know, the elegance, the elegance of Oscar de la Renta. Mm -hmm. Um, do I, am I obsessed with Bottega and right now? Yeah, completely. Um, you know, but I like, but I really, I mean, if I had to live in one, it would be Stella. Okay. 
Um, it's funny you mentioned Oscar de la Renta. My grandmother, God rest her soul, um, was a very stylish, gorgeous woman. And she, I would go visit her. She lived in Las Vegas. And I would get off the plane and she would say, oh my God, what are you wearing? God forbid you met a man on the plane. Get out of here. She would like cover me up and yeah. put something over me and then try and have me fit in her Oscar de la Renta clothes because he would only make her clothes. And she had everything still sitting in the closet with the tags in it or with what, you know, still wrapped up kind of. And she never had anywhere to wear it at a certain point point in her life. And she would always, you know, try and say, well, you should wear this. But for me as a younger woman it did, or a girl at the time, it didn't feel appropriate because it was big and, you know, but now I think it's like, he's such a, an amazing um, it's, designer. It's, pe the, it's pieces of art. Yeah, for sure. The textiles. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, also as you go into different sections of your life, different parts in your life, your style changes, mm -hmm. you know, but like, for example, I'm wearing a striped sweater. I have always been a striped addict mm. because I feel like it's always clean. Yeah. It's very nautical. It's very, but it's also for me. It's like, I can wear the sweater with jeans. I can wear it with yeah. pants. I can wear the skirt. I feel like, you know, but again, it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I know what I like. Yeah. And very often I will love something and put it on and be like, I need to take this off. And sometimes my stylist will say, just try this on. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, no, no, no. And I put it on and I'm like, oh my God, yes. We just mm -hmm. had that happen with a uh, uh, Bauman dress. Mm -hmm. Or I'm well, like, obviously. But I was like, no, 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 no. It's not the right, it's not this. It's not, you know, just put it on. And I was like, okay, love it. <laughs> and I love, I mean, Brunello Cuccinelli, Laura Piano. I mean, yeah. I love all that. I don't buy it, but I, I lust after it from afar. Mm -hmm. I'll just go into Laura Piano and just touch things. Yeah. <laughs> I found for me that I'm always more comfortable in jeans and a t shirt or oh, jeans even a, a wife beater to me. And I look better in that. When I try and get dressed up, I feel like an idiot. Me too. Yeah. Me too. And People are always surprised at that. My, I have a uniform, jeans and a sleeveless white t-shirt. Yeah. That's it's, and it also looks sexy, but cool, you know, sophisticated, you know? And so to me, that's like always the best, but when you're sitting around at home all day and you don't have to see anyone, will you sit around in sweatpants? Oh yeah. What's your favorite brand? I'm just curious. I'm in the market. For I'm into brands. Viore right now. Oh, I don't even know who that is. Okay. Oh, it's so, so of course I love like Aviator Nation and I have yeah. all those, but right now Viore is my go-to. Okay. Yes. And what I love is they can do the little matching sets. So like I have one that like I have the hoodie, the shorts and the sweats. Mm. So I'm like, I've got multiple options here. Wow. Okay. But I'm super into Viore. I was just wearing a Viore sweatshirt yesterday. Okay. My daughter is In really- celery. Into Oh, nice. Yes. My daughter's really into Aviator Nation. I love Aviator Nation. So we have, and we basically are the same size, which is great because then I just have all these extra sets that I can wear around. I mean, I sort of feel idiotic wearing it as, you know, I'm 48. So, you know, that I'm wearing this thing that she would be wearing, but it is very cozy. It looks cute. I can go to the grocery store in it and not feel too messy, you know? I wear a ton of Aviator Nation sweats and sweatshirts. Yeah. I love their sweatshirts. Yeah. You know, but again, you know, and I still go back to like Monroe. Remember the old yes. Monroe sweats? Mm -hmm. They're still amazing. Yeah. Monroe with Splendid or whatever it was. Yeah. It was exactly. Like I mean, that's the thing. And, and But right now, like Viore's on the verge of becoming a problem. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. And are you on the Lululemon kick that so many kids are? But I mean, we've been doing Lululemon for years. Yeah. But it's like an obsession for people these days. Yes. I don't know I'm why. now, my new favorite leggings are, I think they're called on stage. Hmm. And it's because they don't have the seam in the front. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Spanx also doesn't have the seam in the front usually. Yes. 
I don't really wear Spanx. I think you and I are too small for Spanx, but. Well, in a white dress, no one is too small for Spanx. That is true. That is true. Um, You know, when you're wearing white, you always wear Spanx, um, especially if you're going to be in direct sunlight. Oh, okay. Good advice. I didn't know. Anyone over the age of 25 should never be in a white dress in direct sunlight. Okay. Wow. Even the tiniest flaw will show. Got it. Okay. What is your last question on the topic um, of fashion? What is your thoughts about fashion going forward? What would you like to see? What are you into? Like, is there something that you love? I'm, I love, and I always have, this is nothing no, new for me, the quiet luxury. Hmm. Yeah. You know, the, if you know, you know. Yeah. Right. I mean, so many people are into brands or labels or, you know, they have to have the certain types of purse just to show it off. To me, I think it's too much. I think it's, first of all, you can knock those off so quickly. So it's just gross, but I don't like someone that's in too many labels. I think that's ridiculous. So I think that that, quiet luxury is very classy and sexy too. But that's in right now. There was also a time where everything I had had a label on it because that was the look. Yeah. But as I've kind of pared down my wardrobe, I think a lot of people did this after COVID, Mm -hmm. you know, as I've done that, I'm finding that the pieces I hang on to are the very upscale traditional ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, the great blazer. Yeah. The perfect dress, you know those staple items are so important to hold on to. And it's, it's really important to clean out your closet, but like those one, those staple items are, are really important and timeless and you never have to. I just went through a a ton of my stuff and with my stylist and we recut a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I just got back from the tailor address that we bought for my book tour eight years ago. And we changed the neckline a little. We, you know, did this, did that. And it looks brand new. Oh, the other one I could live in is Tom Ford. Right. Oh, yes. That is a good one. Of course. I was just thinking we just remade another Tom Ford dress. Oh, nice. That must be beautiful. Um, You brought up COVID a second ago. I just want to ask you what you think you're your mom would have thought about a lot of the things that she just has not been around for COVID Donald Trump becoming president. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think she would have lost her mind. Having to trap her inside. inside, Mm -hmm. I don't think she would have ever recovered from that. She was such a goer. Right. Do you think she would have believed that that would have been something that could ever happen in the world? No. No, I think, and I think she would be absolutely heartbroken to see what's become, Mm. not just of our country, but of the world. Yeah. Um, And what do you think she would have thought about the political climate? Would she have just made a lot of jokes about it? It would have given her a lot of uh, stuff to use. Well, she was never a political comedian. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it would have given her material. Again, I think she would be really. You know, she was the daughter of immigrants Mm. and really believed and was raised to believe in the doctrine of democracy. And I think all this partisanship, you know, she was always like, you know, just everyone compromise. And I think that would have been extremely disheartening for her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, something I just want to get into briefly is that you and I both know a lot about grief. We know a lot yep. about, um, you know, the effects of grief and also how important it is to share your story because obviously grief is a universal theme. Everybody feels it. Everyone's been through it in their own way. And what was that like for you? You mentioned a little bit ago how you were able to take your father's death and make that into something that was good, you know, that you could learn from, teach others about, but um, how did you deal with the fact that both of your parents are no longer with you and both dry, died in such tragic ways? Um, you know, I always say to people, grief is grief is grief. My grief is no different than someone else's grief. Are the circumstances surrounding it different? 
in how they passed. Absolutely. One was a suicide. One was whatever you want to call it, a malpractice situation. Mm -hmm. It's more about for the suicide. It was more about talking about the anger and making peace with that. And in a strange way with my mother, it was very much the same thing, but not directed at her. Mm -hmm. And, um, I feel like it's my duty to talk about it. Yeah. Because um, I think grief is one of the great levelers. Yeah. My grief is no different than my neighbor's grief. Just because I'm a public figure does not mean it hurts more or hurts less. It's just that everybody knows about it. That's the only difference. Yeah. Guys, what a great interview with Melissa Rivers. Sorry again that it cut off kind of abruptly there at the end, but it was an honor to have her. Uh, please subscribe if you like this episode. Please leave um, remarks. Get in touch with me. You can DM me on my Instagram, which is Rachel you could tell NYC. And please follow us on our Instagram as well, which is Misunderstood Podcast with Rachel. So have a great day. Thanks for listening and see you soon. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.